look at the different types of bonds. Before, we took a look at naming of compounds, and we know that if we have a metal plus a nonmetal, we're going to give it an ionic naming system. And if we have two nonmetals, we're going to give it a covalent naming system. That has nothing to do specifically, well, it has something to do with the type of bonds, but we can take a look at their different types of covalent bonds and their ionic bonds. However, these types of bonds have to do with the electronegativity of the atoms in which are, are bound together. So quickly, if we take a look at this periodic table, notice that, notice that on the, um, Notice that going from left to right on this periodic table, these numbers are representing electronegativity. This number increases as I go from left to right. This number also increases as I go from bottom to top. And the reason is because it depends on the ability of these atoms to hold on to ions in a bond, right? So atoms that are found on the right-hand side left-hand side of the periodic table are going to lose electrons, so they have low electronegativities because they're giving their electrons away. Whereas those atoms that are found on the right-hand side of the periodic table, they're most likely to hold on to electrons and they gain electrons in bonds, so they're going to hold on to those electrons more strongly within a bond. Right? So, but hey, you said, wait, ionic compounds come from ions. So the idea is that, so remember, the, everything that we learn in chemistry has to do with a model. This is a model of what we think bonds are. And it's not a strict ionic, then polar covalent, covalent. It's not strict. It's a continuum. And we may have a metal and a non-metal, and it may not be an ionic compound. How do we know? We look at the differences in electronegativity. So let's take a look at um, a couple of these two compounds or these two bonds that we're looking at here. Let's look at the carbon-nitrogen bond. If I look at the carbon-nitrogen bond, notice that the electronegativity of nitrogen is 3 and the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5. When I take the difference, notice that I have a change of 0 0.5. Well, what that means is that the nitrogen in this bond has a slight negative charge, whereas the carbon has a slight positive charge, and we call this polar. So you know like a magnet has a north pole and a south pole? Well, a bond has a plus pole and a minus pole. And so we call it polar, right? A positive end and a negative end. I like to call this little delta, I like to call it slightly positive and slightly negative. So that's the lowercase delta, Greek delta. Let's take a look at the carbon-oxygen bond, however. Notice that Carbon is 2.5 electronegativity, whereas oxygen is 3.5 electronegativity. When I look at the difference, I get a 1.0 in difference. Now, both of these bonds are polar. So when we look at the electronegativity differences between these two bonds, we can say that the CO bond, the oxygens, hold on to the electrons in the bond much stronger than the nitrogen holds on to the electron in this bond. And so we would consider this more polar. Now when you're calculating electronegativity differences, make sure that you put the largest electronegativity first. We cannot have negative values. Now what is this 0 0.5, 0 0.1? What does this have to do with the ionic versus polar covalent versus plain covalent. So let's say if I had a carbon-carbon bond 
and both of these had electronegativity of 3.0, right? Then the difference, oh, I'm sorry, not, not 3.0, 2.5. So they both have electronegativity of 2.5. So the difference between them is zero. This means that there's complete equal sharing of the electrons. One carbon is not tugging on the electrons more than another, right? So, all right, back to these two over here. I've got an analogy to help. So let's say we were playing tug of war. The carbon-oxygen bond the people on the oxygen side are much stronger than the people on the nitrogen side. If we had two tug of war go games going on, one carbon nitrogen, one oxygen nitrogen, the oxygen, nit the oxygen carbon would pull the other team into the river quicker <laughs> than the one on the carbon nitrogen, right? And so this carbon carbon bond, no one would fall into the mud if we were playing um, tug of war because both sides pull on that rope or which would be our pair of electrons equally, all right? So this would be nonpolar. It is a straight covalent bond where these electrons are spending equal, I wish people could see me, spending equal amount of time on each atom, right? So what that means is these electrons on the carbon oxygen, they hang out more on the oxygen than they do the carbon. Whereas over here, they hang out equally on both carbons, all right? Let's do some practice. Before we fill out this table, let's take a look at how we actually consider polar, co um, pure covalent, polar covalent and ionic. When we look at this table, if you look at more than one textbook, you'll get more than one of these tables. So it's really kind of arbitrary how we split up between ionic versus polar covalent versus covalent. So some textbooks may say 0.5 to 1.8, right? And then some textbooks say 1.9 and above, right? So your instructor will tell you which one of these, tape, which one to use. I'm going to say anything above two, a difference, anything above two is going to be ionic. Anything between 0 0.5 and 1.9 is going to be polar covalent. And anything 0 to 0 0.4 is going to be a pure covalent. Right? So what does that mean? Covalent, we share equally. Polar covalent, one atom holds on to the electron stronger than the other. And in ionic, it's a complete transfer. So I completely lose my electron from the metal, and the non-metal takes it up, right? Whereas in a covalent bond, we're sharing. Both of us have claim to these electrons. It's like divorced parents, right? And you know, sometimes one parent gets more custody than the other parent. So the parent that has the kid longer is the more electronegative atom than the parent that only has the kid on the weekends, right? So if we've got custody and we've got equal sharing of the kid, you've got the kid one week, I've got the kid the next week. Consider that more like a covalent bond. And an ionic bond is one parent has sole custody. The kid has been completely transferred from one parent to the next. Okay? All right, so let's fill out this table. I will do two of them for you, and you do the other two on your own, and I'll come back and give you the answers. So we've got a little practice with naming and writing names of compounds, and we're going to determine whether the bonds are polar, covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. Um, let's see, I'll do the first two for you, and then you can do the other two, and I'll come back and give you the answer. So, nitrogen monoxide, what is the formula? Well, I know I've got nitrogen, and I've got oxygen. There's no prefix on the nitrogen, so there's only one of them. And monoxide means I only have one oxygen, so here I have my formula. 
Now, I want to know if the bond between nitrogen and oxygen is polar covalent, covalent, or ionic. You have to get the electronegativity values in order to determine whether these bonds are polar or not. I will be sure to give you the table when you have exams or it will be given to you in the problem. But I, you can go back when you do these problems, rewind the tape a little bit, and look at the table on the previous slide to help you with these problems. All right, so if we look at the electronegativity difference, um, oxygen is 3.5, nitrogen is 3.0, and we end up with a, zero, a difference of 0 0.5. We look at our little table over here, uh, we are just over the polar covalent mark. So the nitrogen-oxygen bond in this compound is um, polar covalent. FeCl3, this is a metal plus a non-metal, but is it really ionic? Is that bond really ionic? We named it as an ionic compound because just to keep things simple, but to take a look at the actual bonds between the iron and the chloride, the chlorine, um, it may not be ionic. But let's give the name first. FeCl3, well, that's iron. And we know that chloride is Cl minus. So since we have three of them, the iron must have a plus three charge. So... I'll put my Roman numeral three there, and this is chloride. So I want to know if the FeCl bond is polar or not. I want to know if this bond is polar or not. So let's take a look at the electronegativity difference. All right, well, uh, Cl is 3.0. And iron is 1.8. Oh, wow, look at the difference, folks. It's actually 1.2. So is the iron chlorine bond ionic? No, it's not. Based on our table over here, this is also polar covalent. but we name it as an ionic compound because it's a metal plus a non-metal. All right, pause the video and you go ahead and do the last two and I will come back and give you the answers. Okay, let's look at the last two problems. Next we have pH3. Well, in order to name this, we've gotta find where P and H are on the periodic table. P is a non-metal, and hydrogen is also a nonmetal, so we have to name this as a covalent naming system. And I've got one phosphorus, so it's phosphorus. Phosphorus. My R. Phosphorus, and I have three hydrogens, so that's phosphorus tri. Tri. My pen doesn't want to work. Okay, let's make sure this looks better. Phosphorus tri, high, dry. Now, remember, we're only looking at one pH bond. We don't multiply this electronegativity difference. We're only looking at one bond. We're not looking at the whole compound. We're only looking at the bond between the phosphorus and one of the hydrogens. So let's take a look at that electronegativity difference. And phosphorus is 2.1, hydrogen is 2.1, and we get a difference of zero. So this is a purely covalent compound, or let me say that again. This is a purely covalent bond, not compound. This is a purely covalent bond. So phosphorus bonded to hydrogen is a covalent bond. Not polar covalent, just covalent because the difference is zero. 
All right, last one, calcium chloride. You're given the name, you've got to figure out the compound. Well, calcium you know is in group two, chloride is in group seven. These become ions. Calcium is a, is a two plus, and chloride is a one minus, and we swap out our charges, our superscripts or subscripts, and we get Ca. Cl2 is our compound. And we want to know if that Ca, Cl2 bond is ionic, polar, or covalent. I mean, Fe chlor, um, iron 3 chloride was not ionic. Is this one going to be ion? Let's look at the electronegativity difference. All right, so for this one, chlorine is 3.0 and calcium is 1.0. And we get a difference of two. So this is an ionic compound, or I keep saying ionic compound. This is an ionic bond. The calcium chloride bond is ionic. So we can also say that calcium chloride is an ionic compound.